Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to CSIS. Uh, my name is Victor Cha. I'm a senior advisor, career chair here at CSIS, and professor at Georgetown University. Um, and today's discussion is on USROK civil nuclear cooperation, the road ahead. Um, <clears throat> uh, as some of you may, may know, um, CSIS has been doing some work uh, on the USROK uh, civil nuclear negotiations and agreement. We actually uh, had a project on this that had been ongoing for about four years because we all knew what an important um, uh, negotiation it was, uh, not just in terms of the civil nuclear side uh, for industry, but also for the overall uh, relationship. Um, the, uh, it was a long negotiation, as many of you know, and what CSIS sought to do, uh, both in Sharon's shop and as well as in my shop, uh, was try to offer um, uh, independent analysis, uh, research, uh, and um, a uh, sounding board for both the U.S. and South Korean sides as they worked their way through the various elements of the negotiations. And to do that, we had people such as Sharon and Gary and others uh, coming to CSIS uh, to talk about these sorts of issues and bounce different ideas around. <clears throat> um, the result of that for uh, the Korea chair was we produced a, a report the executive summary of which you can pick up on your way out. I think uh, they're, they're uh, unless you haven't already, they're, they're supposed to distribute those to you. Uh, but we thought what we'd do this morning is um, take a look at the road ahead. Um, I think by most uh, 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 analyses that I've seen, this people see this as a significant agreement. And I thought we'd take some time this morning to look at both uh, what this, uh, you know, the overall outcome and how our experts evaluate them, as well as uh, the road ahead and how this agreement sits in the context of a number of other agreements that have been getting a lot more news than the U.S. ROK Civil Nuclear Agreement. And uh, to do this, uh, we um, worked very hard to bring together a fantastic uh, panel, um, Sharon Squassoni, Gary Seymour, and Jody Lieberman. Um, I'm going to turn this over to Sharon in a minute, but let me introduce each of them to you. Sharon, uh, as you all know, is the uh, director of the Proliferation Prevention Program here at CSIS. Uh, she came here from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she was a senior associate in nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, she has worked at the Congressional Research Service as senior specialist on weapons of mass destruction, uh, and also served in the executive branch of the government um, for uh, uh, nearly a decade in the Nonproliferation Bureau at State, in the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency as well. Jody Lieberman has worked in the nuclear nonproliferation arena for nearly 24 years, holding positions within government and in the private sector. Uh, most recently, she examined a broad range of science policy issues for the American Physical Society and participated in a study on technical challenges to reducing nuclear weapons in the United States and Russia, uh, and a review of the Domestic Nuclear Detection Organization Research Plan. She served on the staff of the Senate Homeland Security Committee, uh, spent eight years at the U.S. Uh, nuclear Regulatory, Co Regulatory Commission, where she was the principal point person uh, for activities with the IAEA. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, uh, last but not least, we have Gary Seymour, Gary Seymour is the Executive Director for Research at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School uh, uh, at Harvard. He is also a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a member of the advisory board for United Against Nuclear Iran, a not-for-profit organization that seeks to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, Gary Seymour served for four years as President Obama's White House coordinator for arms control and weapons of mass destruction, including uh, serving as the U.S. Sherpa for the 2010 Nuclear Security Summit in Washington and the 2012 Nuclear Security Summit in Seoul. Um, so um, really a fantastic group that we pulled together. I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, we look forward to the discussion. I'm going to turn it over to Sharon. Okay. Thank you, Vic. <coughs> so, 
I think each of us has prepared uh, some remarks. And uh, Gary, I'd like to invite you uh, first. Uh, and if you'd like to sure. come on up to the podium, we can do that also. Thanks very much, Sharon and, and Victor. Uh, when Victor asked me to do this, I, I, I said, yes, it would be great to talk about something other than Iran. And the first thing I'd like to do is uh, compliment the US and the ROK negotiators, Assistant Secretary Tom Countryman, Ambassador at Large uh, Park Robe Young did a great job, I think, in working out uh, compromises and a new agreement in what was a very difficult negotiation. I remember when we started uh, back in October 2010, about five years ago, I wasn't very optimistic that we could come to an agreement because Washington and Seoul were so far apart on the central issue of um, South Korea's interest in getting legal authority from the United States, so-called advance or prior consent to reprocess or enrich US origin nuclear material. And I understood South Korea's view uh, as an emerging, uh, potentially leading country using nuclear energy, I understood why Seoul wanted to have the flexibility to pursue civilian fuel cycle activities as part of its nuclear program, and why they saw U.S. advance consent uh, as a necessary legal and political uh, support uh, for expanding their civil program. And, you know, frankly, enjoying the same legal rights that Japan has uh, since 1987 in its nuclear cooperation agreement with the United States. Uh, at the same time, Washington was very reluctant to extend uh, prior consent, advanced consent, to South Korea, in part because we didn't want to give the North an excuse to maintain and expand its own civil program, a civil fuel cycle program, which we know is really for nuclear weapons. And we also, there was a precedent that we would break. The US has never provided advance consent to any country that didn't already have an indigenous <coughs> civilian fuel cycle uh, program, and that includes Japan, um, um, uh, the European countries, and India. So we started this negotiation very far apart, uh, but at the same time, neither Washington nor Seoul was willing to let the old agreement lapse because that would have terminated uh, nuclear cooperation. It would have had a significant economic impact in both countries and obviously would have created a political dispute. So I wasn't at, you know, at all surprised in March uh, 2014 when the two sides agreed to extend the old agreement for an additional two years. And my guess at that time, I remember Victor uh, organized a panel and I said at that time I thought that this two-year extension is uh, going to be the first of many extensions and that we might very well uh, you know, be in a situation of rolling extensions for the foreseeable future. Um, so as a result, I was very pleasantly surprised when countrymen and uh, Park were able to agree to an ad ref a new agreement in April of this year. And of course, uh, as all you know, Secretary Energy and Foreign Minister Yun signed the final agreement in June here in Washington. Now, if you look, I sat down and, and read the agreement and all the attachments very carefully. Uh, and under the agreement, you can see the mixture of compromises and quid pro quo that went into this new agreement. Uh, on one hand, the US retains overall consent rights uh, over reprocessing and enrichment of US origin material. But at the same time, the agreement has some special provisions which are designed to accommodate uh, South Korea's interests. Uh, on reprocessing, uh, the agreement includes advance consent for South Korea to ship its spent fuel to France or the UK or any mutually agreed place for reprocessing. And that may help South Korea with the uh, 
uh, challenges it faces in storing spent fuel. And the US retains consent rights over the return of uh, mixed oxide fuel uh, containing plutonium to South Korea for its light water reactors. Um, the other concession the US made was to include uh, advanced consent for certain research and development activities in South Korea. And in particular, this includes uh, uh, activities on pyroprocessing at two facilities operated by, uh, uh, operated by Cary, by the, uh, uh, by the Korea Atomic uh, Energy Research Institute. And in particular, this agreement will allow South Korea to scale up experiments it's doing on something called electro, uh, something called electro reduction. This is the first phase of pyroprocessing, which prepares spent fuel for the second stage called electro-refining, where you actually separate waste from the materials, from fissionable materials that can be used in nuclear power reactors. Um, and so I think that will be an important step for South Korea to continue to do research on the pyroprocessing um, um, uh, both equipment and technology, which of course has been going on for over a decade. On enrichment, uh, the agreement basically provides U.S. assurances to assist South Korea in having um, a secure supply of low enriched uranium for its nuclear power program and also to facilitate possible interest by South Korea uh, in investing in an overseas, a foreign enrichment program, maybe even in the United States. Uh, the agreement also sets up a mechanism and a pathway uh, for the U.S. to potentially uh, uh, provide advanced consent in the future for reprocessing and enrichment uh, under a, a high-level bilateral commission that South Korea asked to be set up under the Deputy Secretary of Energy on the U.S. side and the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs on the South Korean side. And there are four working groups. This is all detailed in the, in the side letter or in the minute to the, to the new 123 agreement. Uh, the four, the four uh, uh, groups, there's one on spent fuel management, one on nuclear uh, exports and export control, one on assured fuel supply, and one on nuclear security. At the most important uh, responsibility of this high-level commission will be to oversee the 10-year joint study that's being carried out between the U.S. and ROK on the technical, economic, and non-proliferation feasibility of commercial scale pyroprocessing. That study began in April 2001, so it's scheduled to be completed in spring of 2021. Uh, my guess is that the study will probably show that uh, commercial scale pyroprocessing is technically feasible, that it can be done from a technical standpoint, and I think the study will show that there are safeguards approaches that will be effective in uh, monitoring pyroprocessing and ensuring detection of any diversion of material. In some ways, I think pyroprocessing is probably easier to safeguard than traditional reprocessing because additional equipment and stages are necessary to separate plutonium and uranium out from the final product, which is designed for fuel. Uh, at the same time, I, I, I think it's very likely that the study will conclude that commercial scale pyroprocessing really doesn't ha have any economic utility at this time. Now, keep in mind that pyroprocessing is designed to produce fuel for what's called fast reactors, sodium cooled fast reactors. And the likelihood of such reactors replacing traditional light water reactors as a power source I think is many decades away, if ever. Uh, so, you know, it's good to have the, you know, technology for pyroprocessing available if it ever becomes necessary, but I think we're many, many years away from any commercial requirement for, for those types of reactors and therefore for, uh, for pyroprocessing. So when the study is completed in 2021, the US and the ROK may very well still have a disagreement about advanced consent. Um, although I can imagine the two sides agreeing to further research and development on, on um, uh, 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 looking at pyro uh, processing. 
Um, in any event, this new agreement uh, only lasts for 20 years with an option for a five-year extension as opposed to the usual 30-year uh, period for these types of agreements. So, you know, at, at some point in the distant future, in 2035 or 2040, the two sides will have to grapple with the issue of advanced consent again when they negotiate a new agreement. Uh, obviously, that's too far in the future to make any predictions, but I, I think we can uh, identify some technical and regional factors that will probably be part of the consideration at that point. On the technical side, I think it will depend on what steps the ROK takes in the meantime over the next 20 to 25 years to store spent fuel. And in particular, I hope the ROK looks at um, above ground dry cast storage, which I think is a very effective uh, technology and cheap and safe for decades of storage. And the ROK will need to make decisions about, about that <clears throat> over the next 20 to 25 years. And it also depends on development in nuclear energy, as I discussed, whether these fast sodium-cooled reactors become a, um, a part of the power industry. Um, it's also going to depend on regional developments, and in particular on the status of the North Korean nuclear threat at that point, something we can't predict, and what, on, uh, what other countries in the region, especially Japan and China, do with respect uh, to their own civil fuel cycle program and most immediately whether Japan decides to um, uh, 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 proceed with uh, starting up the Rokosho um, uh, uh, reprocessing plant, which of course has been delayed for many years. So in conclusion, I think uh, unlike, the, you know, unlike, the Iran, uh, unlike the Iran deal, I think this new 1-2-3 agreement between the U.S. and ROK is a very solid achievement. It's not controversial, I think, for good reason because it serves both countries' interests. It's a win-win outcome, and I expect that it will go ahead and, um, and be implemented, and at least for the time being, it addresses uh, the dispute between Seoul and Washington over advanced consent. Thank you. Gary, thank you. Um, I I feel like there's barely anything left to say. <laughs> so comprehensive. But uh, we're going to turn to Jody Lieberman, uh, who is going to look at some of the congressional issues. And then after Jody speaks, I'll talk a little bit about the non-pro context. So Jody. There is very little left to say. Thank no. you, Gary. <laughs> comprehensive. Well, again, I'd also like to thank our, our kind host, Sharon and Victor, and CSIS, and the Korea Chair for inviting me to this event. Um, I'm in the unenviable position of following up one of the key negotiators for the White House, so I'll do my best. Um, what I thought I'd do is just a quick overview of what's happening in Congress at the moment. That doesn't include the Iran agreement. Um, and some of these points you're all probably well aware of. Um, as Gary mentioned, the um, agreement that was set to expire in 2014 was uh, extended to uh, 2016, and it was the vote in the House and the Senate were unanimous. I think that's notable. Uh, the final agreement was signed in Washington on June 15th of this year, and on June 16th was sent by the White House to Congress. Uh, now, of course, therein begins this 90-day clock that some of you might be aware of, a 30-day consultation period per the Atomic Energy Act, um, 120, Section 123B, followed by 60 days of continuous session. Uh, per the AEA 123D section. So that clock, of course, has been ticking. Um, as you're also aware, I'm sure Congress has the uh, option of adopting a joint resolution of approval or standalone uh, legislation in which they can approve or disapprove the agreement without any conditions. Uh, but of course, any efforts by Congress to block the agreement would be subject to a presidential veto. That, of course, hasn't actually happened. Um, now, I see my colleague Mark Holt in the audience from the Congressional Research Service. CRS has estimated that the congressional review period is likely to be completed somewhere between October 29th and December 7th of this year, uh, depending, of course, on any expected congressional adjournments and other things that are going on uh, on the floor and in the various committees. 
In July, Senator Cardin, who is the ranking member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, introduced a resolution of approval for the agreement, Senate uh, Joint Resolution 20, on July 29th. And the identical bill, its companion, was introduced in the House by the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Royce. That's House Joint Resolution 63. Now, of course, that wasn't really necessary. Um, the clock could have simply run out, and the agreement would come into force if Congress hadn't acted. However, um, these two resolutions were introduced basically to indicate congressional support for this agreement. Uh, it didn't have to be done, but I think Senator Cardin and Mr. Royce felt that, that this was an appropriate thing to do. So those are good signs. Uh, whether or not these resolutions are actually acted upon uh, is, remains to be seen, but it, it sort of doesn't matter either way, frankly. Um, I would note that Senator Corker, who is the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, did not co-sponsor the Senate resolution. However, there's nothing nefarious in that. Um, the senator is um, very much of the mind that regular order should be conducted, which means that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will likely have a hearing on the agreement within the next month or so. Again, we know how congressional schedules can slip. Uh, and I believe the House has the same intent. Um, that having been said, my understanding is that, as, as Gary indicated, some of the real difficult issues have been very ably negotiated and concluded by both sides. And it is my sense that any concerns by members of Congress regarding pyro processing, for example, and advanced consent have essentially been addressed in a way that they feel is adequate. Um, so I, I don't think that there's a lot of um, concern in Congress at this time about this particular agreement. So this is all good news. Um, and of course, the bear in the room, the 20-ton gorilla, the Iran agreement really is front and center. And I think timing will play on the side of the Korean 120, US-Korean 123 agreement in that everybody is so focused on Iran and yelling and screaming about how that agreement falls short that this agreement simply doesn't match up, both in terms of noise uh, as well as timing. So of course, the extension runs out early next year. The congressional clock runs out before that. So I think really timing is on our side in terms of this agreement. And it's my prediction, you heard it here first, that this agreement will enter into force without any problems on the congressional side. That's really all I had to say. Thank you. I'm going to follow suit with my colleagues and talk from the podium. Try and keep an eye on the clock. Um, I agree with you, Jody. I think that uh, this is. Uh, I guess the real question I'm going to ask you later, Gary, is: Is this the sleeper issue? You know, every, everything is so quiet. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see so many people uh, here in the audience today because um, every time I've tried to <clears throat> find out about this agreement, talk to friends on the Hill, they've been like, hmm, what agreement? You know, so in part it is the, the super saturation with Iran. Um, <clears throat> but also, you know, there are some really technical issues in this agreement. And there's, um, you know, unlike Iran, uh, it's unfair to compare anything to Iran, but you know, there's no, there's no been really strong lobbying on this. Um, on the other hand, I think the implementation may be a little tricky. And I think um, much like the Iran agreement, the two sides may have some differing interpretations. And especially this inclusion of pathways toward, and I'm quoting the non-proliferation assessment statement here, pathways toward a possible US government decision to grant advanced consent to uh, South Korea to enrich or pyroprocess US obligated nuclear material. T to me, that ensures that the negotiations haven't ended. They've just begun. <laughs> so I anticipate um, uh, we're, we're not really done with this yet. Um, but I want to step back and, and paint a little picture for you on the nonproliferation context. And you know, this 
every time the administration, not just this one, but previous ones, come to Congress with a nuclear cooperation agreement, they say, well, this is a un you know, unique agreement. Well, some are more unique than others. And I would suggest that this South Korea agreement is pretty unique. In fact, it's pretty creative. Um, but um, with creativity comes some risks. Um, from the broader nonproliferation context, I would say, you know, I conclude that this case-by-case -case approach, which is what the administration has uh, decided to go with rather than a principled approach, it risks undermining a few longstanding nonproliferation um, policy objectives. Despite our best efforts, countries are still going to see precedents where we don't want them to see them. Uh, and some unique solutions may become new norms. You only have to look at the Iran agreement. You know, people are already trying to look at that agreement to see, well, are there things here that we can use in the broader nonproliferation agreement? You know, Iraq in the 1990s, a very unique situation, and yet we changed our, you know, we strengthened our safeguard systems in response to that. Um, and then just, uh, small thing, you know, the fact that the agreed minutes to this agreement are longer than the actual agreement itself <laughs> speaks volumes about the U.S. efforts to customize this agreement. So um, I have about uh, five points I want to make on, you know, these unique solutions, and Gary's covered quite a few of them. We might, I might take a slightly different orientation. This joint fuel cycle study, I see this as you know, originally it was, or it could be interpreted as devised to buy time, right? Five years ago, 10 years ago, the parties were really very far apart. And so, you know, as a, it was a mechanism to buy time and to allow for a balanced review of spent nuclear fuel management options. There are a few small paragraphs in this 50-page tome that say, and oh, by the way, we had to transfer, we had to conduct a nuclear technology transfer agreement to actually transfer sensitive nuclear technology to South Korean nationals working in Idaho on pyroprocessing. Um, rather than, and, and I think the initial goal in the U.S. was to keep hot processing, radioactive processing, in the U.S not in South Korea. And that has, as far as I can tell, largely gone by the wayside. Um, Annex 1 and 2 list the facilities, and Gary mentioned some of them, where there will be some hot processing done even before any, you know, in the end, uh, if advanced consent is granted. Um, and then if advanced consent is granted, additional facilities can be listed in Annex 3. Um, that joint fuel cycle study, as Gary said, will report to this high-level bilateral commission. And I would just note, um, you know, in the, in the agreement itself and in the nonproliferation assessment statement, you know, when you look at the description of those working groups, the first two, the one on electrochemical recycling and the one on safeguards and security, they have a lot of detailed objectives. And the last one, which was fuel cycle alternatives working group, has a small description. Well, it's evaluating options. Um, related to, you know, storage, transportation, and disposition. So the lesson I take away from that is that, you know, if you create programs for cooperation with money, which is what we have done with South Korea on this, you will strengthen constituencies for technologies and, and technological approaches. Not always a bad thing, it's just an observation. <coughs> this high-level bilateral commission, this is unique. This uh, replaces previous commissions that we had under our agreement with the ROK. And you know, traditionally, the State Department has taken the lead for these, uh, what they call, now I don't remember the, ac the acronym is the JS, right. uh, Joint Standing Committee on Nuclear Energy Cooperation, right? And the NPAS even says that the committee with the ROK has been the model for all of our other committees with other countries. And yet, when you look at the, this high-level bilateral commission, it's chaired by the Deputy Secretary of Energy. <laughs> and on the Korean side, it's chaired in the, the Foreign Affairs Ministry. So I would ask the question, I'm not sure why the State Department is giving up its leadership on this or what the implications are, but the fact that the 
State Department still has the lead in negotiating 123 agreements kind of causes me to question this. Um, the other big question is, can the U.S. afford to do this with other countries and other agreements? Now, again, it goes back to the case-by-case -case approach, right? South Korea is special. We have this special you know, committee. But um, I think it's just a matter of time before <laughs> other countries look at that and say, well, maybe we want to do this. Um, the third thing, pathways. Um, I do agree with Gary that I think the joint field cycle study is going to be positive on the technical feasibility and the safeguardability. Um, but I think you're optimistic that um, the outcome on the economic viability of the technology is going to be negative. Um, and here's why. First, the economics of commercial reprocessing are still hotly contested despite countries having reprocessed for decades, right? Second, although the US and others have attempted to argue against the spread of enrichment and reprocessing on the basis of economics, economics rarely wins over sovereignty and prestige when it comes to nuclear energy. There are a lot of uneconomic <laughs> projects out there. Mox comes to mind, but um, I think it'll be difficult for the US to dispute South Korean claims on economic viability, particularly because there won't be any real data from actual operations by the end of this study. And also because South Korea has insisted on, and this is a long-standing insistence, on taking into account the social and environmental costs and benefits of, of the option in the context of the relevant parties, laws, regulations, policies. Sorry, that's a quote from the agreement. Um, the bottom line is, as long as South Korea views pyroprocessing as an alternative to siting nuclear wastes, the political and social costs of storage and disposal are always going to be figured as assets for pyroprocessing. In other words, when they look at if it's pyroprocessing versus nuclear waste disposal, the, the, the tremendous political difficulties they've had, including payments to communities, they look at that and say, well, pyroprocessing is a better economic choice for us. On enrichment, the economics are better, but they favor existing technology holders. And here I would say that South Korea nominally meets the new NSG criteria for enrichment transfers. And if it succeeds in going down that route, and I'm not going to say whether that's, you know, how feasible that is now, there's no reason why it wouldn't meet the criteria that you see under the high-level bilateral um, commission. <clears throat> One niggling question I have, maybe Mark Holt can answer this for me. And the, the question is, um, this requirement in the agreement for um, an agreement in writing on an arrangement after the high-level bilateral consultations, does that supplement the need for a subsequent arrangement? In other words, have we already kind of gone most of the way down the road to giving them advanced consent on enrichment? Um, the last point on pathways, why wouldn't other countries insist on the same, even though they're not anywhere near as advanced as South Korea in, in nuclear energy? And the last two points um, in terms of the uniqueness um, or creativity in this agreement, Gary mentioned um, the advanced consent for storage and transferring to third countries for reprocessing. It's not unique to the ROK agreement, but it's a relative innovation in our history of 123 agreements. We gave it to the UAE. We gave it to Taiwan. It's perhaps more um, justifiable in the Taiwan and, um, and South Korean cases because capacity for spent f nuclear fuel storage um, is, is almost uh, at the limit. I would suggest, however, that this undermines the US position that reprocessing is not needed for a civil nuclear energy program and um, undermines our, our policy preferences for longer term interim storage and disposal. Uh, and finally, the return of material after reprocessing. The NPAS calls this, well, this is similar, but not exactly advanced consent to retransfer. So the important feature here is that it allows South Korea to receive back nuclear material recovered from reprocessing provided that the parties agree, agree in writing on certain things like the forms and physical protection. It's not entirely a big advance consent because I'll have to go through a subsequent arrangement, which means Congress looks at it for 15 
um, days. So um, how does this agreement compare to others? Well, you know, there's always this underlying persistent notion that good allies deserve generous agreements. Um, and in general, 123 agreements uh, are considered prestigious and strategic, even though they are just framework agreements for cooperation. The agreement with India, remember that one? That's a prime example, but there are a few other relevant ones like Russia, China, Japan. Um, the generosity that South Korea was seeking in this case, given that it couldn't get actual enrichment or reprocessing from the US, was this advanced consent. The concept and the practice of advanced consent was developed in the 1980s, actually, to circumvent the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Act requirement for consent. And I think it's funny in this impasse that it actually says, well, advanced consents are, have long been understood to be consistent with the AEEA. And then it also says, no provision of the act precludes the US from giving these approvals in advance. So they're a little defensive on that. Um, in practice, these advanced consents have become the stamp of approval for cooperating countries to do their own enrichment or reprocessing with US origin material. So who has that? Japan, Euratom, China, India. Russia has it for enrichment, but not reprocessing. And then, of course, lesser forms of this advanced consent have been given to countries to send out their nuclear fuel for reprocessing to other countries, and that's the case here for the ROK. Taiwan, UAE, Switzerland, and Norway. I would suggest that the kinds of advanced consent that we see in this agreement are really incentives for South Korea to send its fuel out for reprocessing instead of doing pyroprocessing at home. But the inclusion of pathways for this possible US decision down the road uh, for advanced consent could negate those incentives. And the high-level bilateral commission will ensure that there's enough political pressure to continue making this um, a strategic issue. Um, I'm going to save enough time for our discussion. And, and I have I've made in my testimony to Congress specific things I want to talk about broader issues related to Congress and its role here. Um, but I'd just like to close with. Um, uh, a funny contrast, you know, the Japan agreement will be, uh, will have its, an, I can't even call it up for renewal, right? It's not going to be renewed. <coughs> the initial term ends in 2018. It's a very sharp contrast with the Japan agreement, which will likely skirt all political controversy despite a lot of controversy over its nuclear program and, you know, whether or not it's going to reprocess because of a very clever automatic renewal clause in that agreement. And so that's why we have to pay attention to these 123 agreements, because they actually do have a very long-standing impact. So thank you. Um, and uh, I've gone on too long, but I want to start our discussion here uh, before I welcome your questions. So it's a little unfair to let me be the moderator. <laughs> as a speaker, but... Um, you know too much. No, 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 no. Um, back to my... I, I guess I want to ask you, Gary, you've been involved in this a long time. So what's <clears throat> changed between the beginning of these discussions and now in your estimation? I mean, I, you know, for me, the mystery of this negotiation <clears throat> is why Seoul decided to come to an agreement at this time. I mean, the extension was for two years, and I naturally assumed, given normal Korean negotiating practice, and frankly, normal negotiating practice in the international arena, that you wouldn't see an agreement until the very last minute of that two-year extension, because that's the way people normally negotiate against a deadline. So I would be very fascinated. I haven't asked my Korean friends to find out why President Bak Kone decided this was a good time to do a deal. And as I understand it, uh, I at, at least spoken to friends in the State Department, there's been very little controversy in South Korea, despite all of the uh, you know, press stories about nuclear sovereignty and so forth. As far as I can understand, this agreement has not led to any strong opposition within the National Assembly. 
So, you know, to me, the interesting question is why did Korea decide this was a good time to come to an agreement, which, as Sharon has pointed out, is a, a texture of compromises. Um, as in most difficult nuclear, as in most difficult negotiations, as I say, you can pick apart the agreement and figure out Washington gave this and Seoul got that and Seoul gave this and Washington got that. That's the way international negotiations take place. But the timing is a mystery to me. I don't know why Korea decided to settle now when they could have waited another year and a half. Maybe they thought they had to do it when Obama was uh, in office. I don't know. That's interesting. Maybe in the, when we do the Q&A, some of you who may follow developments in Korea closer might help us to understand what the reasoning was in Korea for why they decided to accept the deal at this point. Do you think that Korean objectives have changed at all? I don't see any sign of that. I, th I mean, my sense is that after five, almost four years of really tough negotiations, the Koreans concluded that they were not going to be able to achieve advanced consent, and so they settled for a series of compromises, which you know, was, was a step in the direction, including the, basically a delay on the question of the, the fundamental issue, but some steps toward, some leaning toward the possibility of achieving it down the road. Do you think in terms, and Jody, you should feel free to <laughs> jump in here too. Do you think um, with this high level bilateral commission and it being chaired by energy rather than state, do you think that makes any difference at all or um, and, and the, the reason why I ask is, um, you know, you're up, up there at Harvard, and if I recall um, dredging the cobwebs from my brain, you know, Graham Allison, essence of decision, bureaucratic politics model, sorry, that's all my papers, bureaucratic model, po no, no, it's okay, model of politics. Um, energy has, you know, on the one hand, in the nonproliferation um, policy, um, you know, ultimately everybody sort of, you know, salutes when the policy comes out, but they have a different sure. spin on non-pro programs and, right. you know, technology development and, uh, you know, Idaho and Oregon National yep. Labs. It was Oregon, actually, that developed yep. these pyrochemical processes, yes. so... And they're clearly advocates for it. Right. I mean, I think in the course of my career and, and, and yours as well, I think there has been a general tendency for the State Department to become a less important player in nuclear cooperation. I mean, that in the... You know, when I first started in this business in the Reagan administration, international nuclear cooperation was a much more, el much more important element of U.S. foreign policy than it is now. I think in part because the U.S. nuclear industry has really atrophied. And, you know, frankly, other countries have, uh, you know, invested much more resources in developing their nuclear capacity, and U.S. cooperation with the U.S. is just less, less attractive. So I think it's sort of been a part of an overall trend for energy to become more, more active in the international nuclear space. Mm -hmm. But you're right that the White it's up to the White House to keep responsibility for overall policy. And you know, that's where the decisions will be made about when to make the next exception on advanced consent. I would actually like to jump in on that and, and provide a slightly different view, which is in, in the time that I've been sort of in and around Washington, I, I think Gary's right that the sort of the prominence of the energy department has waxed and waned depending on who runs it. Um, but I do think that the sort of prominent role of Ernie Moniz, who is a physicist, he is a scientist, um, and his ability to participate in a diplomatic uh, setting in a far more adept way, I think, than a lot of his predecessors has also perhaps changed things a little bit. Um, after the conclusion of the Iran uh, negotiations, there was a lot of coverage, and Dr. Moniz has talked quite a lot about the scientific and technical aspects 
of the Iran deal, and I myself am very pleased to see that. And I think, as Sharon highlighted earlier, the devil is going to be in the details. Um, as a former regulatory person, you can write and say anything you want, but when it gets down to it, the implementation is really where the crucible test comes. And in, in my view, because of these interesting nuances of this particular agreement, it will in fact be the energy department who has the expertise in helping to implement these arrangements. Just my own thought. Right, and there's language in the NPAS, the Non-Proliferation Assessment Statement, which speaks to the Secretary of Energy's responsibilities under, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's Section 131 of the Atomic Energy Act. Um, I have a bigger congressional question for you, which is, okay. is congressional review of these agreements like a thing of the past? I mean, I, the, Congress may not even have a hearing on yeah. this unless Senator Corker insists on it because he said, you know, he wants a hearing. But is there is there a enough interest? I know there's frustration, or there was frustration in Congress with their inability to kind of get a hold of, um, uh, or inability to influence nonproliferation policy, particularly going back to this gold standard issue, uh, which is requiring countries to forswear enrichment and reprocessing uh, as we negotiate agreements with them. Um, but you know, does Congress have the bandwidth? Do they have the expertise? Does the system need to be overhauled? Because it's kind of weighted, and this was intentional under the NNPA, it's kind of weighted towards approval. It, it's hard to disapprove an agreement. Uh, I don't think it's a thing of the past. I can tell you that, um, having sat on both sides, uh, Congress and the administration, um, getting rid of that um, requirement, members of Congress will go kicking and screaming. I mean, they will demand, heck no, we, you can't get rid of that. That having been said, I don't believe they have the bandwidth, and they certainly don't have the expertise to evaluate highly technical agreements. I mean, I, I know that for a fact. I've observed folks in Congress who have staff who actually have PhDs, who have knowledge of the nuclear fuel cycle, um, and they're mostly gone. Um, I mean, Sharon and I and Gary know, I'm sure, quite a few of them, and there are very few left. Um, so the expertise, I don't believe so, no. However, they do have the legal jurisdiction, and as I think we've seen in discussion about the gold standard, H.R. 1280, and this subsequent um, legislation that was introduced, there is a desire, at least little pockets, of desire to, in fact, expand congressional uh, ability to disapprove an agreement. So um, I agree that there isn't the bandwidth, there isn't the expertise, but I don't believe that it's going to legislatively go away anytime soon. I, I don't. Uh, the question, so another question okay. would be, is, is there anything afoot to strengthen congressional review? I mean, I put ideas out every once in a while. Sure, <laughs> They sure. float in the ether. Uh, not at the moment, not that I know, how, know of. Um, it's sort of an interesting discussion because this very same members of Congress who are basically saying, yes, the US ROK agreement is, is wonderful, it's terrific, uh, we agree that there are important trading partners and the like, and uh, the extension was unanimous, but then the same folks who are acknowledging our important relationship with South Korea are now turning around and saying, yes, but Iran. Um, and we can't do the same thing with Iran. So they're saying, let's enforce a gold standard, but take a country. <laughs> they're sort of speaking out of both sides of their mouth, frankly. They're saying, our relationship with South Korea is, is different. So we should be treating them in a way that's different. Well, that runs contrary to the argument for the gold standard, which is, everybody needs to sort of be held to the same standard of forswearing enrichment, forswearing enrichment and reprocessing. Right. I mean, I was just gonna, just to add to that, there really isn't any leading members of Congress, leading senators who are interested in nuclear energy and nonproliferation policy. I mean, in the golden days, you had Senator Glenn and people like that who really cared about these issues, except for maybe Senator Markey on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I don't think there's anybody I mean, they tend to view these as, you know, case by case, how they, 
you know, how, what they say about our relationship with individual countries, whether yes. friends or enemies, rather than as a broad policy. And I, I think that just reflects, uh, as I said, the State Department is not that as interested in nuclear energy agreements because it's not as important to the country as it was 30 years ago. And I think that's true in Congress as well. I, I would actually add one more item, and that is um, Senator Luger is emblematic of one of these right. people who was and is, continues to be very, very passionate about this issue. However, if you look at the electoral consequences of late of members of Congress being interested in something that frankly is seen as esoteric and sort of, this doesn't put food on my table, why should I care about it, frankly? And that's the way electoral politics has very much become in this era. Uh, and Senator Luger paid the electrical consequences. Uh, for a long time, he was essentially able to, well, really do what he wanted. I mean, make his constituents happy, of course. But he was also able to do, pr sort of pr pursue this kind of esoteric, almost academic endeavor with nuclear nonproliferation. Well, as electoral politics have changed, so has the ability, I think, of members of Congress to really focus the way that their predecessors have on issues like this. And I think we're the poor for it, frankly, because they do have a legal responsibility to do this. Um, and we can't expect that there will always be this blank check, as it were, that the 90-day clock will always run out and the administration will do what it needs to do. So I don't know what the future is going to hold, but I think the electoral pol political reality is that I don't know we're going to see a Senator Luger anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Carrie, I want to ask you, uh, and Jody, you can feel free to answer this also, um, a slightly obnoxious question, <laughs> which is uh, Iran. Um, you know, we talk about economic, as I mentioned in my right. remarks, uh, you know, uneconomic enrichment and or reprocessing. Well, uh, mm -hmm. There is still no economic justification Absolutely. for Iranian uranium enrichment. Yeah. Do you think this will make it harder as we talk to our South Korean yeah. colleagues in the future? I don't know if this has come up, uh, not just South Korea, it could be Ooh, any sure. of our other um, cooperating partners that might be interested in acquiring that. Right. And there aren't too many, but yeah. does this make it tougher? I mean, it, yes, I think it does, but it's important to keep in mind that the Iran deal is not a peaceful nuclear cooperation well, yes, agreement. Well, no, yes, no, absolutely. It's an arms control agreement designed to prevent a country from producing nuclear weapons. And as part of the compromises that were made in that agreement, we've accepted that Iran will have a uh, um, indigenous enrichment program under the rubric of civil nuclear technology, even though we don't believe that's what their intent is. So I'm sure that other countries in the future will, may very well try to use that same rationale, even if the program is purely for civil purposes as opposed to a disguise for pursuing nuclear right. weapons. Right. And finally, before we turn to our audience, um, one, I guess it's kind of a technical question. In looking at the these three criteria, technical, feasibility, right. environmental, and the, the safeguardability, it seems right. to me that <clears throat> initial discussions um, on pyroprocessing were about you know, proliferation resistance mm -hmm. and enhancing or, or decreasing the right. proliferation risk. But the language in there now in that agreement is very focused specifically on safeguarding the technology. Right. Does, do you think that that makes it easier to come up with a positive response on that? Well, I, you know, question? as I said, I think yeah. the answer will be yes, technically it is safeguardable. I mean, I agree with you that the economic criteria is the fuzziest, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if the two parties can't come to an agreement on whether pyroprocessing is economically viable or attractive. But if they disagree, then there won't be an agreement on advanced consent. So I don't, I mean, the pathway does not, to the extent that the pathway requires the two parties to come to a consensus on the criteria for the joint study, I, my prediction is that in 2021, there may not be an agreement. And that if there is a disagreement, it's most likely to be on the economic right. criteria. Okay, great. Your questions. We have some microphones coming up. Please identify yourself and your... Sure. Uh, Andrew Patterson from EBI Verdigree Capital. Question for Gary and then comments from Sharon and Jody. So take 
Sharon's point that outside the United States, it's political factors over economic factors, unlike the blind spots we Americans have. How does this agreement give us market advantage beyond nonproliferation and waste management into new build, either UAE, Saudi Arabia, Czech Republic as examples, or back into the United States where we're seeing foreign actors at Vogel yeah. at summer for the next wave of new build. What does this cooperation agreement do for U.S. market advantage right. in new build? I understand the question. I mean, I think there are two elements, and maybe others will uh, can answer, uh, 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 might have a better answer. I think, first of all, to the extent that the ROK is going to be active in exporting power reactors, including to the Middle East, which of course they've already done in the case of UAE, that will include U.S. content, both technology and components. So with this agreement, I think it creates a framework for uh, closer collaboration between American companies and Korean companies in marketing power reactors around the world and you know, competing with the Russians who are selling very cheap and in my view, not necessarily as high quality a product, but certainly the price is right. So that'll be an interesting question. Well, cost provider exactly, and the second is this, I mean, I don't know whether South Korea is interested, but the agreement at least creates a framework for South Korean investment um, you know, in, a, 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 in a new enrichment facility in the United States. And I, frankly, I don't know whether the market really needs more enrichment <laughs> capacity. My guess is that it's probably already pretty full. But, you know, again, that's at least a possibility. If the Koreans want to invest in an overseas enrichment plant, I hope they do it in the United States. But I, I, I mean, others may. No, I, I actually agree with Gary. Um, obviously, the United States nuclear industry is no longer in a position to go it alone. Um, clearly, um, there are components we don't make domestically. We rely on the South Korean nuclear industry to produce them for us. And what I've seen, I, I was going to talk about Silex, laser enrichment, is that the U.S. is simply not working on these technologies by themselves anymore um, for various reasons. And we sort of almost don't have a choice unless we shut down the domestic industry to reach out to others. Now, it, it puts an, us in a kind of an interesting position because of our nonproliferation goals and the fact that with every technology that we pursue, either jointly or alone, you're um, kind of setting a precedent for these technologies. Um, if we prove that pyroprocessing is com commercially viable, then there are other countries that are going to want to pursue it, and do we want to really set that precedent? Um, sure, we want to be part of those things, but do we want to be sort of promoting them? And so I think there's a double-edged sword there in going into some of these new technologies. But I think the short answer is the U.S. simply can't do it alone anymore. We can't. We have a question up front here. Microphone. Oh, here. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Jung Min Kang uh, from uh, Nuclear Program of NRDC. I have uh, two questions for uh, Dr. Uh, Samo. The one is about uh, nuclear export, and the other is about uh, uranium enrichment. And uh, 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 the new 123 agreement uh, would facilitate the South Korea's nuclear export. But even under the current, uh, even under the new agreement, the South Korea can only export its nuclear power plant to the country that have a 123 agreement with the U.S. Right. So the South Korean government uh, has an uh, interest in, in exporting its nuclear power plant to Saudi. Mm -hmm. That have uh, yes. no one to three agreement with the U.S. Yes. The, what is the prospect of yeah. uh, one to three agreement between U.S. Yeah. and the Saudi? The other question is uh, about enrichment. Is there any, uh, under the new one to three agreement, is there any possibility for South Korea to have a joint study with the U.S.? in uranium enrichment, as a, yeah. like as a fire processing. Yeah, that's, I mean, let me try to answer. Those are both very good questions. I think on the second question, I don't see anything in the agreement that would preclude joint research uh, on enrichment. So I think that's an issue that certainly uh, under the high-level bilateral commission, one of the working groups is on, is on fuel supply, assurance of fuel supply. 
And that could be one of the areas of discussion. So I don't think there's anything in the agreement that prohibits that. Um, the question you asked about Saudi Arabia is very interesting. We were, we've been talking about the so-called gold standard, the, the standard that uh, is contained in the UAE 123 agreement with the United States. I've always been very skeptical that we would be able to obtain the same standard in any other country in the world. And I know that in the case of Jordan, where we tried to insist on, where we did insist that they meet the same standard as the UAE, Jordan said no. And that's why there isn't a one, two, three agreement between the United States and Jordan. Uh, at least, uh, you know, when I left the White House, we were having exactly the same discussion with Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia, like Jordan, refused to any legally binding provision in the agreement uh, to, uh, you know, prevent them from pursuing fuel cycle in the future. And my guess, especially in the wake of the Iran deal, is that Saudi Arabia is not going to be willing to agree to a permanent ban on pursuing fuel cycle, um, if only for political reasons. Not that Saudi Arabia has any near-term plans for pursuing civil fuel cycle, but I, I, I would be very surprised if Saudi would agree to change its position. Um, in this country, one thing that you know might awaken congressional interest in one, two, three agreements is if the administration submitted a U.S.-Saudi one, two, three agreement that didn't include the golden standard. I can imagine that uh, that might get some congressmen interested. So, you know, you may have identified a very significant issue that the U.S. will have to face, that if we want to export power reactors to Saudi Arabia, and I'm not sure how serious that is, frankly, but, you know, the Saudis in theory, and of course they have plans for a very large buildup, but if they do want to pursue it, and we want to be part of that market, you know, with the ROK or with other countries, we're going to have to make a decision about whether we insist on the gold standard in the case of Saudi Arabia. Okay. Other questions? Sure. Thoughts? Please. <laughs> Do I have an opinion on that? Uh, well, let, let, let me... Uh, well, I was just thinking to myself, you know, would Saudi... In, in new negotiations with, with us, would they want a pathway to, I mean, what, what they're looking for ultimately would be someone to give them enrichment technology, right? To Which do no one that, will. I mean, they don't have an additional protocol yet, right? I think. I don't know, I don't remember. So uh, for a long time, Saudi had just a yeah. small quantities protocol, uh, so there are steps that Saudi Arabia would need to take yep. to meet the NSG criteria right. to begin with. Um, but but if, it's looking, if it's looking for, you know, a nuclear cooperation agreement that, you know, gives them enrichment, we're, we don't do that. We just don't do that with anybody. And I don't um, think anybody will. I mean, I don't think any of the established nuclear suppliers will sell civilian fuel cycle technology to the Middle East. I mean, they haven't done that for, you know, decades. I mean, since France had agreement with, uh, France and Italy had agreement uh, with some of the, uh, you know, Middle East countries. So I, you know, the only way the Saudis can get enrichment is like Iran did, under the table, from Pakistan or North Korea or somebody like that. Because not, they're not going to get it as part of a civil nuclear cooperation agreement. But at the same time, you can understand the Saudis will say, I mean, I can understand their argument. They'll say that, you know, in 15 or 20 years, we may face a situation where Iran decides to expand its civilian, uh, quote unquote, uh, enrichment program to the point where it has a much more viable option to produce nuclear weapons. And we can't afford to foreclose that option in the long term. Even if we don't have any near-term plans, we can't agree in perpetuity to deny ourselves that, that possibility in 20 or 30 or 40 years. And I, I doubt we'll be able to you know, persuade them otherwise. Mm -hmm. And the big question is whether or not the other nuclear suppliers continue to toe that line. You know, the argument has always been, well, if the US doesn't, then another right. country will. So I wonder if the U.S. government's hand will get forced ultimately by some of the other nuclear suppliers, perhaps France. 
I mean, when we were in the White House, we had, to, we of course thought of this idea that if we were going to apply the gold standard, we wouldn't want to be the only one. And the discussions I had with the other nuclear suppliers were pretty clear that uh, they were quite happy if we would apply the golden standard because that would create a wonderful market opportunities for them. And I doubt very much that that has changed. But <laughs> as I've written previously, and I'm, I'm an unabashed um, supporter of the gold standard, but that's a whole other subject, um, the nuclear industry and the State <coughs> Department back in the late 70s made very similar arguments right. against the NNPA. They said, well, if the United States institutes these new uh, strictures on nuclear trade, well, other countries will happily step in. And that's not actually what happened. Um, I mean, there were other things that came into play, but that's not actually what happened. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent about whether or not that'll really come to pass. One difference uh, today is that Russia right. has emerged as yep. uh, you know supplier, not just you know back then it was the Eastern Bloc, right? Right. So yep. we were, we were a bipolar <laughs> <laughs> nuclear right. world also. Right. Yep. Uh, and they've emerged as a, a big, big player. That's, that's but this point. is always the tension, right? It's do we cooperate with countries because it would be better, you know, if they're going to get the technology anyway, or they're going to, you know, it would be better because we right. have stringent security, nonproliferation, all the rest of it, um, or leave the market open. I don't know. Mm. Uh, you have to draw those lines somewhere. Um, we had a question up front from Florence. Florence Loli from Gabby. Um, I'm asking this question for sake of argument. <laughs> um, both Gary and Sharon mentioned that uh, pyroprocessing is technically visible and yet it's not economically viable. Um, how much of a foreign country have saying about each individual country's economic viability or economic standing or what is mm -hmm cheap, what is expensive. Right. I mean, is there a good enough excuse, not uh, excuse, right. is it good enough <clears throat> argument when it comes to pyro processing? Yeah. I mean, to me, the main uh, drawback or limitation of pyro processing is that it's linked to the deployment of fast reactors for power sources, because that's what the kind of fuel it's designed to produce, which is a good thing if we ever actually build power reactors that are based on sodium cool fast reactors, but I just think, I mean, the nuclear community has been dreaming of closing the fuel cycle to use fast reactors for decades, and I don't think we're any closer, I mean, Jody's more of an expert than I am. I, I think we're further away today than we were in the 1960s to actually building those types of reactors as power reactors as opposed to research models. So I think it'll be decades, it'll be long past my lifetime before anybody ever runs a fast reactor for power. I, I don't know, what do you think? No, I, I actually agree, and, and I actually identify as well with, with Sharon's remarks that the economic viability of technology may not necessarily be the, the key decision-making point. Um, the most recent example I, I could use is the um, laser enrichment in the United States. Um, at least 20 countries, including Iran, have tried to scale up a laser enrichment facility and have as yet not done that until GE partnered with Hitachi to build this facility in the United States. And my uh, organization that I um, used to work with um, actually did an economic analysis of laser enrichment and it was proven not to be economically viable. However, that did not stop G. Hitachi from applying for a license to scale up this facility. Um, so I think in the end, sovereignty is going to win out whether or not this technology is economically viable. I think the, the key is whether or not it's technologically viable um, in a small scale. And then number two, can you scale it up? And if you can scale it up, all bets are off, in my opinion. I would just say, you know, Florence, your, your, your point is a good one, right? So even we think about the cost of different energy sources, and we think those costs are global, right? But, but they're not. So for example, coal in Korea or for Japan is far more expensive. And when you look at the life cycle costs, uh, nuclear compares a lot more favorably in a country like Korea you know, than it does in the US, obviously. There are a lot of different factors that go into it. However, 
you know, particularly with reprocessing, um, you know, countries embarked on reprocessing in the 70s based on cost assumptions about uranium, right, and the scarcity of uranium, and the desirability of, or the, the economic attractiveness of moving to a plutonium-based um, nuclear fuel cycle, right, and fast reactors. Well, it d didn't pan out. Um, and what you have is the buildup of a lot of plutonium around the world, which creates nuclear security issues. Now, pyroprocessing is different, right? Because it's not separate, you're not gonna have separated plutonium. Um, you know, I agree on your basic point, you know, who, who are countries to, to, you know, tell other countries what's economically <coughs> viable or not. But the issue in this cooperation agreement is you know, what can Korea do with U.S. origin spent nuclear fuel? And that's where the, the you know, that strong connection and the collaborative decision making uh, needs to be. I think we have time for one more question. We have two minutes. I saw a hand up here. I'm Jess Ryu from Korea Atomic Energy Research Institute. I just a simple question for the Sharon. Uh, the, without the economics, uh, with the with regard to the economics of reprocessing, the, without any the uh, without any the economic viability, the, do you believe the South Korea the pursue, pursue the pyroprocessing agent as you said the, the alternate long term of long term alternative option? Just a simple question. If it isn't economically viable, would South Korea pursue it anyway? Yeah, without any economic viability, do you believe South Korea pursue the, the pyroprocessing as an alternative option for the long-term management of spent fuel? I'm it's not sure I question. understand your question. Should South Korea pursue it if it's not economic? Is that no, the just question? Or, the, uh, or just economic part out of the Oh, taking it away? And I mean, is uh, South Korea I believe at this moment, South Korea, if we have, uh, if we have uh, the economic viability, until then, the only for the reason is uh, I can lead to the pursuing the power processing. Without any the economic viability, we don't want to mm. the, yeah. the pursue yeah. the power processing. That means is, uh, it, it, we don't need to some, some when we discuss uh, the the economics of uh, reprocessing, we cannot, de we cannot uh, differ from the, between the pyroprocess and uh, the purex. The, mm -hmm. As you said, mentioned that uh, when you, the, the, from the past uh, more than two decades, uh, the reprocessing doesn't have uh, any economics, but uh, it's a really, we only focus on the Purex, the Purex is that you can uh, separate the proton and uranium. But power processing is the ultimate goal of power processing is to the burn of the TRU, trans uranium elements. It's, an, it's a totally different technology. I mean, it's uh, economics maybe right. will be different. And then uh, I believe that right now South Korea, uh, if we have only for the economic viability, we will pursue the Pyro processing. That's my, I, my issue. There are so many issues we could, and we have in the past, sat for hours and hours <laughs> discussing <laughs> these issues. You know, right now, what, one of the problems with pyro processing is batch processing, right? So it's very difficult to scale up. Um, you know, if you're going to base your entire fuel cycle on fast reactors with the recycle, of this fuel, then it needs to be cost effective. I mean, the, the problem with, it's not that fast reactors don't work, it's just that they're, well, some of them don't, but it's, it's that they're not commercially competitive because they don't, because their you know, operating capacities aren't high enough. So there are so many wonderful, as a technology, I like pyroprocessing. It's very attractive. It's kind of cool equipment, all of that stuff. but. Um, you know, there are a lot of nuclear technologies that are not, not, have not been commercializable. Remember, this is, if anybody here doesn't know this, it's not a new technology. The Koreans have a little bit of a twist on it, but this is a technology that's existed for 50 plus sure. years. 
And so there are a lot of fantastic things that work well in a laboratory, but when you come to commercializing them, um, it's a different story. Now, you know, a lot of that has to do, I think, to, uh, to electric vehicles, right? Some of that has to do with markets and incentives and all the rest of it. So I wouldn't, you know, entirely rule it out. But I don't think we're there yet. And I'm not really sure that we'll know that much more in the next six years. So while I think the joint fuel cycle study is, you know, is a good effort, I don't think we're going to have all the answers in the next few years. Any Could I just words? add, I mean, my impression is that in Japan and China, the economic considerations are very important. I mean, the Chinese have been looking at recycle for a long time, and I, my impression is that they've concluded that for now, it just doesn't make any economic sense for their power program. They'll keep the technology available, and maybe in 20 or 30 or 40 years, it will, become, it will make economic sense. But I, I think the Chinese have decided that for the time being, you know, they don't want to pursue at a commercial scale. And I think in Japan, it, there's also very strong economic disincentive for starting up Rokosho, because they just don't have any means to burn the plutonium. I mean, they're going to they're gonna run this very expensive facility, build up a lot of plutonium, and they don't have any way to get rid of it. Well, that's South Korea's decision. I mean, if it was me, I wouldn't pursue something unless it actually <laughs> paid off. I believe that we have pursued the need to be helped. Right. Because we have the economic factor. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists, and thanks for your attention today. Thank you.